Well, a very good morning to you, and we're so glad you've joined us again for our online worship. Our time together, uh, I trust, will be guided uh, most of all by God's Word and also by a presence of His Spirit, even though we're um, at a distance, but virtually we're connected, and even more importantly, spiritually, we are connected in the Lord. And I hope that these words from Psalm 97 will be a welcome to you, to uh, draw you into the presence of God in worship today. Psalm 97 encourages us this way. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your greatness and your, your glory and your power, and we pray uh, that we would, be, we would be mindful of who you are as we approach you uh, in prayer today, seeking you, uh, in worship, honoring you, and uh, in your word to learn from you, to hear from you. We pray that you would receive the glory and the honor. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I trust you're enjoying this season. Uh, many people have great delight in this season of harvest and thanksgiving and of course there's always the pumpkin spice latte um, but uh, last weekend uh, I learned about this event that took place out in Wanick and that was a giant pumpkin contest and I uh, read in the newspaper that uh, Joanne and Trevor Halliday took first place with a pumpkin now get ready for this that weighed in at 197 kilograms now incidentally uh, Joanne helps us, uh, helps our church with arranging our insurance. Uh, so that was kind of interesting to hear that her husband had grown this huge pumpkin. Uh, now, today in our, our message, we're talking about prayer. And I think it's uh, certainly fitting because of the schedule. Uh, currently, uh, or tonight, uh, there is a citywide prayer event, and we want to encourage you to zoom into that. The details are, of course, on our website. But, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking that sometimes prayer feels unattainable or what we think prayer should be feels like something that we'll never quite uh, uh, get to. And uh, I, I think of that as a, you know, I, I'm interested in gardening and I think I'll never grow a pumpkin that's almost 200 Kilograms, And I wonder if you sometimes feel, as a follower of Jesus, I'll, I'll never be the, the person of prayer that uh, I, I think God expects me to be. Well, I think our passage today has something to say about uh, that struggle. Our current sermon series is Thankful, Evidence of Gratitude in the Lives of Jesus' Followers. And if you haven't already guessed, the evidence that we want to look at today is uh, prayer, or specifically intercession, the practice of praying for others, the practice of bringing the concerns that uh, others have and our care for them, bringing that to God in prayer, uh, really reveals that we're a thankful people. You know, so far we've looked at um, four out of seven evidences that a follower of Jesus is thankful. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, we, we observed that he, he pointed to joy as an evidence of thankfulness. Uh, to Rome and uh, the Ephesian church, uh, Paul referred to the uh, matter of submission, how that expresses that we're a thankful people. Generosity and freedom, another expression. We looked at uh, both of those topics as Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthian church about them. And then on Thanksgiving Day, we considered uh, from the letter to the Thessalonian church, the idea that when we celebrate uh, faith in the lives of others, that shows that we're a thankful and a grateful people. As we've said, Paul wanted to help 
first century Christians navigate their faith journey in, uh, in difficult um, political and uh, religious times. And we also live in times that are difficult, uh, times that are confusing, destabilizing, and really intercession is essential equipment for any Christian in any age. And so we want you today to really take note that intercession has this linkage with thanksgiving. Colossians 4 verse 2 makes it very clear. Paul writes, devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now, I think that's very revealing that thanksgiving has, as, a, as it were, a, a foundational contribution to us being in a constant state of prayer. Now, maybe you want to ask yourself, what fuels your prayers? Is it desperation? Is it a sense of duty? Uh, is it kind of cold and mechanical? Or is your prayer life uh, taking on a great deal of excitement as you see God working in the lives of people around you? We do need to think about what drives our prayer life. And today I want to suggest that one of the key drivers of a Christian's prayer life is, is thankfulness. If we're not content, if we're not thankful, if we're not grateful to God, prayer is probably not going to be uh, coming along naturally in our Christian journey. So I want to read with you a call to intercede that we get from Philippians chapter 4, and I'm beginning at verse 4, just a few verses today. Philippians chapter 4, 4 to 7. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the book of Philippians really is a book that revolves around this matter of thanks. I, I think Paul was particularly thankful for the Philippian church. He saw them embrace the gospel. He planted a church in the living room of Lydia. He uh, experienced imprisonment and um, miraculous release from prison in Philippi. And I think there was a lot of reason for Paul to look back on his experiences there and be, be incredibly thankful. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16. Uh, but very specifically, uh, just a few uh, uh, verses on, Paul gives a more particular reason why he's thankful. And let me just read Philippians 4, uh, beginning at verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And he goes on to talk about his uh, thankfulness and appreciation and, and even uses it as a teaching point uh, the fact that they had sent financial support to him and his ministry team. So Paul outlined the way in which this church had been helpful to him and now he's um, reminding them to be thankful and in particular that thankfulness should fuel our prayer. Now I think that this passage, short little passage, can be kind of uh, sketched out on a little bit of a design. And I'm going to give you sort of the sketch in word pictures in, in, in three different sections. The first would be if you could just in your mind's eye or even on a piece of paper, just draw a big circle. And that represents the environment, first of all, the environment in which we pray. And the environment that I see here uh, through this passage, uh, verse, uh, both verse 4 and verse 5, tell us that there's three ingredients. There is the consistent joy, a real visible gentleness, and then the giving of thanks. So uh, thanks is not the only aspect of the context for interceding, but along with um, gentleness and along with joy, uh, we're told that there's a context, there's a, there's a setting, a proper environment. If we're going to be engaged in prayer in a meaningful way, way these uh, aspects of, 
of um, our character need to be in place. You know, if if it's the opposite of these characteristics, if there's fear and guilt, obligation, then our prayers uh, might be uh, might be present, but they'll be perfunctory. Our, our prayer prayer life uh, might function, but it will will be very cold and mechanical. Uh, when we are in a joyful, um, gentle with others, thankful attitude, then this sets the stage for prayer and intercession. Now, I think the next part of your, our sketch, not just a, a circle with these uh, three characteristics, but right dead center, it seems like the main focus is that there will be an exchange take place. And Paul makes that clear in both six, verse 6 and verse 7. In exchange for our anxiety, God promises to give his peace. Be anxious for nothing, verse 6. Um, let the peace of God or the peace of God will come and rule in your life. In fact, Paul says, instead of having anxieties, as we uh, exchange those with God, what God is giving us is not just a temporary or a superficial peace. He says, first of all, it's a peace that goes beyond what we could even comprehend. So he will bring a peace to our hearts that will supersede some of the difficulties that we face. Uh, similarly, this is not just um, a superficial or um, fleeting uh, peace that God brings. It is a peace that actually the, the, the terminology that Paul used was it will come and it will be like a sentry on guard of your heart and your life. So with that kind of peace, uh, why wouldn't we exchange our anxiety and receive God's help in, in our time of need? Do we recognize how passionate God is for us to make that exchange? Dallas Willard has written, prayer is a matter of explicitly sharing with God my concerns about what he too is concerned about in my life. And of course, he is concerned about my concerns and in particular, that my concerns should coincide with his. This is our walk together. Out of it, I pray. So there is this context in which the Holy Spirit is producing gratitude, gentleness, joyfulness. And in that um, setting, an exchange can take place. And the invitation is, give me your anxiety and I will give to you my peace. That is what God offers to us. So I guess the question then becomes, quite obviously, how does that happen? How do we execute that? How, 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 does, how do we make this exchange take place? Well, it takes place, uh, Paul says, through prayer. And he also used the term supplication. In, in many ways, we could take both of those terms and combine them and simply say our petitions, our requests, our uh, longings that we give to God. This is what we are invited to do. It really isn't complicated, is it? It's not about us achieving. It's not about us um, winning some uh, place before God. It is simply about us, as Dallas Willard says, uh, out of our walk with God, just telling him uh, what our needs are. Now, it, we should notice that this is very deliberate and this is very intentional. And of course, it's not because God lacks information. It's not because God doesn't have an intimate awareness of what we need. In fact, we can be sure that whatever we think our need is, God is more keenly aware of what we truly need. So obviously, it's not that we have the role of informing God, but we have the role or we have the experience of growing in trust and dependence upon him. God is not... Uh, void of information. He is inviting us uh, into a place of deeper dependence, deeper trust, and that happens as we deliberately and intentionally and in an ongoing way make this exchange through 
bringing him our petitions. And it's important that we understand that when we are praying and giving petitions to God and when we're particularly thinking of the needs of other people, well, we simply call that intercession. We're interceding for someone. We're bringing a concern on behalf of someone else. And I think uh, what's very important about this is that Paul uh, wasn't um, uh, uh, trying to be a lone ranger in his ministry. We pick the story up in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, where he says this, God will yet deliver us. Paul had many experiences of difficulty where he, he saw God powerfully work on his behalf. And he said, God will again, or he, he'll continue to deliver us. You also joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Now, this is one verse that we can claim when we start to think about uh, trying to have a partnership impact across the globe. We are not in Colombia working with the needs of street children in Medellin. We are not in Africa serving uh, the orphan. We, we cannot be in other places, but just like Paul said to the Corinthians, you can be part of my ministry. How? By prayer, by intercession. And I think it's very, very important that Paul says, when you partner up with me and it's through prayer and we practice intercession, what happens? Thanks results. I would say thanks is fueling the prayer in the first place and thanks uh, to God is also the result of the prayer. So how does this work out in our experience? Remember, it's very really important that we don't you know, draw a, a circle and then a, an exchange line and put a, put a sketch together and, and, and sort of pass off this experience as something that's rather cold and mechanical, uh, so, some sort of scripted experience. Um, when I think of that kind of experience concerning prayer, it takes me back to a number of churches that I've visited. I haven't gone to the worship services of these churches. These are historic, some of them a thousand year old church uh, in, in Europe uh, in particular, but I've seen another church in in Quebec where the thing that I observed consistently that there was some uh, physical mechanism by which people could uh, offer um, a ritualized prayer. Usually this had to do with candles. There are many shrines and churches, uh, particularly in Greece where we have visited, where you will walk in and uh, it's, it's thick with candle smoke. Uh, you can buy a one euro uh, candle to five euro, can five euro candle, not year old candle, but use five euros to purchase a candle and then it is um, lit and put in a, a container of sand and um, this represents uh, some form of intercession, it's, it represents some form of ritualized prayer. Now, I don't know the heart of the people that offer those prayers. I simply want to stress that let's be very, very careful that we don't read a passage like Philippians 4, verse 4 to 7, and then just flippantly say, uh, well, there it is, you know, there's the script. You got to make an exchange um, and, and it becomes something ritualized. Rather, it is about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our shepherd, our guide, the one who indwells us by the Holy Spirit. And intercession is not cold and mechanical. Intercession is real and it is relational. Now, I love the writing of Timothy Keller, especially his book, Prayer, uh, Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God. The, there's a lot just in that title, right? To, to, to pray is both uh, awe-inspiring, but it's, it's an intimate experience at, at the same time. And um, in part of his book, uh, Keller was uh, reflecting on a, a poem, and quite an ancient poem by George Herbert, who made the comment that prayer is the church's banquet. 
Now listen to what uh, Tim Keller says about that. Feasts, he writes, were never mere feedings, but a sign and a means of acceptance and fellowship with the host. Prayer is a nourishing friendship. So how do we see prayer as a nourishing friendship? Maybe two important roles will be helpful as we examine these. And for this, we're just going to flip back to the book of Matthew and examine something that Jesus said about our interaction with our Heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 7, and I'm beginning at verse uh, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. So the first role that we encounter is the role of uh, true children of God. These verses leave no doubt that to act as God's true child is to ask is to approach, is to ask, is to seek, it, it, it is, is to call upon God. I go back again and again to what John Newton wrote. He uh, also is the writer of Amazing Grace, and he said this. He said, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his love and power are such, thou canst never ask too much. Now, James chapter 4 Verses 2 and 3 suggest that there are some challenges to our asking. It's not just that we become spiritually lazy. Of course, that could happen, and we just don't bother to pray. But all too often, our prayers are a result of an unforgiving spirit, maybe conflict, maybe an unresolved issue, a broken relationship with someone else in the church. Interestingly, in uh, Philippians 4, just a few verses before our passage for today, Paul was highlighting that two ladies in the church, key ladies in the church in Philippi, would, would um, re renew their unity in the Lord. They were uh, in conflict. And um, as children of God, if we're in conflict with one another, we cannot fulfill our true calling, which verses 7 and 8 here of Matthew 7 simply say, is to come and to seek our need before the Heavenly Father. And we've talked about what kind of uh, context should be happening in our lives for that to take place. A another role that we need to understand is uh, the role of our true Father. Uh, we need to act as his children, and we need to be responsive and, and appreciative of his role as our Heavenly Father. Let me uh, continue to read here at, uh, Matthew 7, now verse 9. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. What does it mean to receive uh, from our true Father? Well, I think it means having a correct belief uh, in who he is, a belief that is expectant for him to ask. I'd refer you to Hebrews 11, verse 6. Faith is about expecting. Faith is about uh, looking for what is yet unseen, but believing that God will produce that. And so we come to God uh, not with fear, not with doubt, uh, not with a uh, uh, unbelief, but we come with an expectation that he will be our true and good Heavenly Father. Now, some of the challenge surrounds uh, us understanding that if we're asking of God to act, um, what about his uh, eternal divine purposes? Do we actually initiate some sort of alteration in his plans for this world? Um, I love what C.S. Lewis writes about this. He says, God has retained a discretionary power of granting or refusing 
our request, except on that condition, prayer would destroy us. Now, I think it's very comforting to think that we're not coming to a heavenly father who says, you want that? Have it. Want that? Have it. We are to pray, obviously, and bring our concerns in line with his will. We know that from many other scriptures. But if we're asking as true children and we're approaching with an appropriate understanding of our good and, and holy heavenly father, we will be looking for the answer that he has for us, not merely expecting God to do uh, our bidding. Dallas Willard makes the comment that when we have the needs and the concerns of another person on our heart, especially somebody who is broken and in need of returning to God, um, he says we trust God not just because fixing this person is beyond you, but because it is good that it should be beyond you. It is good that um, it is our Heavenly Father who moves and acts and does his will among us. We are invited to come as tr his true children, asking, seeking, knocking. And then our expectation uh, can be of our true and good and, and holy Heavenly Father to act in the way that will bring glory to him and good uh, to us. So as we wrap up, I want to uh, ask you to think about intercessory prayer at this Thanksgiving harvest season. Are, are you reflecting upon the good things that God has done in your life? And are, are you allowing that sense of gratitude to, to move you forward in more prayer? Not just prayer for yourself, but as we'll gather tonight to pray for our city, as we'll gather next Sunday, and we'll in particular be praying for the persecuted church around the world. This is the work of intercession. Dallas Willard goes on to say this about prayer. Prayer in the manner of Jesus will have incredible results. And thanksgiving will be a constant theme just because that his uh, this reality, this is the reality of our relationship to God. We are thankful when we know we are living under the provisions of his bountiful hand. And so I want to encourage you today. Sometimes we feel, uh, as I said at the outset, that uh, attaining some level of prayer is beyond us. And I would encourage you simply to look at the good things God has done has done and is doing in your life. And let that sense of gratitude well up in prayer uh, for God to act further. Uh, thanksgiving is the fuel of our prayer. When we're a thankful people, we're going to be uh, contented and, and you know, operating in a gratitude that will push us forward into praying for others. I trust God will encourage us in prayer uh, and um, encourage us to be engaged in interceding for others. I'm so glad that you could spend this time together with us in God's word. We realize that our service is uh, more abbreviated from what we've had in the past months, but we trust it is encouraging you. And I do want to uh, conclude with a benediction, but just a few reminders for you. Please do visit our website. There are uh, a number of posts that we've put up this week, some concern uh, intercession. Uh, they concern our prayer uh, gathering for our city tonight. They concern uh, some really um, um, difficult uh, bills that are before uh, our federal uh, parliament and the, those really require our prayer. Uh, we've got all that information for you, other events, uh, events for young adults, and uh, we really want you to be able to, uh, even if you can't participate fully in person, at least track with what God is doing, because just as Paul said to the Corinthians, you can participate. You can participate by prayer and be a direct uh, part of what God is doing. And so I just want to uh, encourage you as we close today with uh, this uh, encouragement of Paul's to the Thessalonian church, 
Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. May God bless you richly today.